good evening, everybody, um, people in the room and people who are joining us online. Uh, it's a huge honour and privilege to be standing here in front of you. Um, uh, in the next 45 or so minutes, um, I'd like to share with you some personal experience and some thoughts about the climate and the wider environmental crisis that we're in, um, some thoughts about how we got here, about what lies at the root of it, and about what we need to pay attention to in order that we can get out of it and continue to flourish as human beings. I'm not an academic theologian, unlike my illustrious predecessor in this lecture. Um, I'm just a very ordinary working bishop who takes prayer seriously, um, who reads the Bible with a curious mind and an open heart. And I find in it a story about people's experiences of God, people from a time and a culture very different to mine. A story almost certainly from the evidence written down by men, an account of how these far off people changed their views over time, guided by insight and by their experience of God. A God who I think has gradually revealed more and more about God's self through the history of this people and then dramatically gave them and us a reveal which changed history and I believe can change lives in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's where I'm coming from. I was ordained, uh, as we've heard, 24 years ago, and I've wandered through the pathways of the Church of England, uh, emerging two years ago into a role which is fascinating and serious and joyful. At times, it's deeply hilarious. Uh, note the headgear, which I'm not wearing this evening. Uh, at times, it's deeply frustrating. At times, it's very painful. But it's a great and strange privilege always with glimpses of glory. I'm really not quite sure what I'm doing here in front of such an august, intelligent and keen group of people, except that Vincent asked me to give this year's lecture, and I've always done what Vincent has asked. <laughs> From chatting with some of you before the, uh, before the talk, uh, I gather that's the experience of some others in the room. Vincent is somebody who's had a profound impact on me since he was the director of St Albans and Oxford ministry course on which I trained for ordination. And he's someone who's helped me to make sense of a baffling church. I spent my formative Christian years in a variety of DIY congregations in Africa where I spent my 20s and early 30s doing relief and development work. In the mostly Muslim countries where I worked, Oddball gatherings, which called themselves church, met mostly on Fridays in borrowed buildings or under trees. And in these gatherings, Lutherans, Mennonites, Southern Baptists, French Protestants, Anglicans high and low, and a variety of other miscellaneous Christians offered what they had into the mix, and somehow God blessed it. When I began training for ministry, I didn't realise there were tribes in the Church of England. On my first evening on the St Albans and Oxford ministry course, somebody asked me what my tradition was. I simply didn't understand the question. I was most perplexed by it. I hadn't heard of Catholics and Evangelicals and all the other labels which float around the place. I scratched my head a good deal, finding God in all things and in all people. And I emerged after three years of training a fully-fledged mongrel, confident that that was OK, because Vincent said it was. I could tell you a lot of other Vincent stories, but perhaps they're for later. <laughs> so what I'm going to offer you this evening isn't an academic lecture, and it's not a theological exposition, and it's not a view from any one tribe in the Church of England, but it's a bit of a ramble through some interconnected thoughts which may lead us to conclude that the climate and environmental crisis is a deeply spiritual issue and that our faith uh, and that people of faith have a crucial role to play in the survival of our species over the coming centuries. I want to start with something about common responsibility and social cohesion. I mentioned that I'd worked in Africa, and one of the things that I became fascinated by was pastoralism. 
Pastoralism is a production system which enables a group of people to utilise arid or semi-arid lands where the rainfall is too low for crop production by herding livestock. There are high value animals like cattle and camels, which are the main stores of wealth. And there are small stock, sheep and goats typically, more used for daily consumption. The animals provide pastoralists with a store of wealth and cash when needed, with meat, milk, hides, blood, and a means of forming and sealing relationships. They have enormous cultural significance. Pastoralism is a highly efficient way of enabling marginal land to support life, culture, and community. Now, pastoralism depends on common access to grazing and common access to permanent water sources for use in the dry season. If these are available and accessible, then it's possible to exploit a vast area of grazing during the, dry se during the wet season. If the dry season water becomes unavailable because it's been privatised or monetized, then the system collapses. So water is a very political issue. And it's one which was at the heart of my university work on changes in wealth distribution in Kenyan Masailand. This experience was formative for me because it brought me into close touch with the land, with the environment, with the essentials of life and community, fragility and strength, and the whole notion of what it means for a group of people, a community, a society, a nation, a world, to utilise a common one might say God-given, resource in such a way that everyone benefits. And it made me aware of the dangers which individual selfishness and self-interest can pose to the common good. You may well be familiar with the expression, the tragedy of the commons. In 1833, a chap called William Lloyd published a pamphlet called The Tragedy of the Commons, which included a hypothetical example of the overuse of English common land where villagers graze their cows. For each additional animal, a villager individual could receive additional benefits, while the whole group shared the resulting damage to the common. If all villagers made this individually rational economic decision, the common could be depleted or even destroyed to everyone's detriment. This idea was picked up again in an extraordinarily influential article by Gareth Hardin in 1968 with the same title. And although his article focused heavily on the issue of population growth, it laid out the commons dilemma. And it's been very widely picked up by a huge number of disciplines as a way of analysing uh, a number of resource allocation problems in today's world. Water, forests, fuel, fish, and the general issue of environmental sustainability. In the face of our global environmental emergency, we're facing our biggest ever challenge to make the commons work. The collective use, protection and management of our commonly owned planetary resources, land, water, oceans and everything in them, fossil fuels, the very air that we breathe. Now, the thing about the commons is that it's perfectly possible and widely evidenced for a group of people to use a commonly held resource in a sustainable way, as the nomadic pastoralists of Africa have done for centuries, regardless of what economic theories would have us believe about the innate primacy of individual self-interest. As long as there are shared social structures and relationships, shared belief systems or formal rules that govern access, and use, then all is well. So for centuries, the Maasai of East Africa, the Somali clans of the Horn, the Tuareg of Niger, and many other groups have lived successfully and successfully exploited an environmental niche which no one else can. But if you disrupt or remove the shared social structures, if you fail to agree on the rules, then the common enterprise cannot succeed. This has started to happen big time in the East African rangelands and elsewhere, where governments, encouraged by the World Bank, undergirded by a particular economic philosophy, and combined with a deep suspicion of nomadic people, 
have issued individual land title, allowing enclosure and privatisation of the rangelands. The gap between rich and poor has grown. The wealthy have benefited, thousands have become destitute. This perhaps is the true tragedy of the commons, the disruption of a sense of responsibility for each other. Rowan Williams, in his little book, Being Human, talks about the uncooperative self. He says that labour, production, business have all moved away from a sense of belonging with each other and taking responsibility for each other. As individuals, we want to be more and more in control and we're uncomfortable with limits. So we exploit the environment and we seek and expect greater prosperity. We long for perfection in our bodies, in our marriages, in our jobs, in our homes, wherever you look. However, Rowan Williams says, cooperation is hardwired into us for survival and it can be reclaimed, but only by a systematic challenge to assumptions about what a human being is, a person forged in relationship with others. A person whose essential worth, like that of all others, comes from the fact that we are seen by and engaged with love. This sense of being a person in and through our relationship with others is at the heart of the concept of Ubuntu, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. I exist in and through you. It's part of the Zulu phrase, Ubuntu ungumuntu ungabantu, which literally means that a person is a person through other people. Ubuntu has its roots in the idea of community as one of the building blocks of society. It suggests common humanity, oneness, shared interest, empathy, concern, love. Because without love, we're nothing. So, to the Anthropocene. We're all familiar, I'm sure, with the term the, term the Anthropocene by now. It's the name unofficially given to the age that we've been in since arguably the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the large-scale burning of fossil fuels. It's the age in which the activity of human beings has had a direct and measurable impact on the climate. Now, I'm not proposing a discussion about the exact terminology here. It's been very widely discussed. But what is absolutely clear is that due to human activity, the climate is changing and changing very, very fast. The latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, published last August and ratified by 195 countries, sent shivers down many spines. The headline is that climate change is widespread, rapid and intensifying. It's intensifying the water cycle, affecting rainfall patterns, causing sea level rises, coastal flooding and erosion. It's amplifying permafrost thawing, causing ocean warming, acidification, reduced oxygen levels. It's causing extreme heat, dangerous to human existence, especially in urban areas. We've seen the fires, the floods, the shearing of Arctic and Antarctic ice giants, the cyclones, the storms. We've seen them all on our screens. Many of the other changes are less visible, but no less dangerous to life. We'll all, I'm sure, have had our light bulb moments and facts which have hit us in the face about this. My most recent one was hearing that the Amazon, the lungs of the planet, is now a net emitter of carbon dioxide. The effects of our abuse of the commons of the planet, the air, the water, the soil, the forests, the oceans, is now apparent to all of us. Whether we live in a part of the world where toxic smog hits us in the face every time we step outside, or where the countryside surrounding us for miles is charred and smoking, or where houses and whole villages are swept away by torrential floodwaters, or where we can't grow our staple crops through absence of rainfall, or where extreme heat and the wet bulb effect is actually hazardous to human life. We're no longer in any kind of ignorant bubble.
So to biodiversity. The biodiversity crisis is another emergency, more wide-ranging, more slippery, more difficult to seize hold of and address. We can't fail to be aware of the COP26 conference uh, on climate change held in Glasgow a couple of weeks ago. But biodiversity was the subject of another less well-publicised COP last month held online, with part two scheduled to be held in the spring in China. It's very, very complex trying to make headway on this because the biodiversity crisis is multifaceted. The UN's 2019 Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity, which is one of the most comprehensive studies of the health of the planet ever conducted, tells us that due to human impact on the environment in the past half century, the Earth's biodiversity has suffered a catastrophic, unprecedented decline. An estimated 82% of wild mammal biomass has been lost, and 40% of amphibians, almost a third of reef building corals, more than a third of marine mammals, and 10% of all insects are threatened with extinction. Mammal biomass on the planet today is 4% wild animals and 96% humans and livestock. And 70% of all avian biomass is poultry. We're in an age when our impact as a species is having a catastrophic effect on the other species that we share the planet with. And the huge irony of this is that we need this biodiversity in order to ensure our own flourishing. Because we rely on nature. We rely on it for food, for building materials, for warmth, for textiles, for the active ingredients in medicines, and much more. And there are other vital functions that nature provides, from the pollination of plants, to the filtering of air and water, to the enrichment of the soil and protection against floods. The biodiversity of our planet is the result of about 3.8 billion years of evolution. And our human existence in the current age is at serious risk because of our increasingly rapid destruction of the very systems that support life on Earth. Unfortunately, all too often we forget what nature gives us. In our industrial societies, Biodiversity is simply taken for granted and seen as something which is free and eternal. But the reality is that many human activities are posing a major threat to thousands of species through the destruction and fragmentation of habitats, pollution of the air, the water, the land, overfishing, overuse of forests, the introduction of non-native species, and of course, the release of increasing amounts of greenhouse gases that cause climate change. We are not, as many of us would perhaps like to think, a species which stands at the apex of a pyramid of creation. We are an integral part of a highly complex, highly sophisticated web of life on Earth, which operates as a complex adaptive system. What happens in one part of it impacts on all other parts for good or for ill. Our human actions in the past half century have largely been for ill. And it doesn't take us long to see that many of the pressures we're subjecting the system to are in fact symptoms of wide and deep issues. Unsustainable patterns of consumption, demographic change, globalization, and I would suggest a deep, deep spiritual crisis. The challenge that we face is not simply a technological one. Part of its solution may emerge from technology and scientific advancement. This has clearly been the hope of many who attended the COP26 and talked in such resonant and glowing terms about sustainable growth, which seems to me to be the oxymoron of the century. But listen to the words of Gus Speth, much quoted now, the former deal of Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. <laughs>
The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. So how have we got to where we are? I suggest that we are here partly because we've become separated from, alienated from, the rest of creation which surrounds us. We've come to treat it as a thing, as us and them or us and it. We've lost sight of the integrated nature of things. I consider myself, and I say this very honestly, to have been hugely fortunate to have spent several years in Africa living in a mud hut with no running water and a long drop out the back, eating a very simple repetitive diet, which was already much richer than that of most people around me, and witnessing at first hand a deep connection, which is both practical and spiritual, between people and their land. If you meet someone in the streets of Nairobi, for example, and ask them where their home is, they won't tell you about the shack in the township on the edge of the city where they live. They'll tell you about where their land is, their shamba, where their animals are. It's where their maize crops growing. It's where their relatives are buried. They may live in the city, but it's not their home. They know who they are and they know where they come from. And for those living in the rural areas, they know that if you don't plant, or the rain doesn't fall, or the insects get out of control, or the goats get in, you won't eat. At the COP26, the voices and the wisdom of indigenous people struggled to be heard. But we would do well to listen. I met an Aboriginal pastor, an Anglican priest, who spoke of how white people have treated his people, have displaced them from their land, have separated children from parents, have forced them into re-education into Western ways, have denigrated their culture and their spirituality, and of how his people still walk backwards into the future, bringing with them the wisdom and understanding drawn from 60,000 years of deep connection with the living world, all ignored, discounted, or even scorned. We in the so-called developed economies simply don't understand this sense of connection with the natural environment and it makes it hard for us to connect emotionally with its riches and its fragility. We have another problem in the rich developed countries which is also related to our distance from a sense of what is essential and what isn't. We've lost sight of how much is enough. We've been programmed especially in the years since World War II, to want more and more stuff. To compare ourselves with others, to keep up with the Joneses, to desire deeply the latest, smoothest, slickest, most pleasing item on the tech list. To discard our clothes, our gadgets, our toys, even our relationships without thought, and to replace them without calculation. We've lost our sense of contentment, and we've become highly individualised in the way that we live our lives and make our choices, ceasing to be aware of the impact our choices have on others or on our common humanity or on our world. Duncan Austin, in a fascinating essay with the snappy title, Market-Led Sustainability is a Fix That Fails, traces the evolution over the past three centuries of greed from being a vice to being a virtue. Thomas Sedlacek describes this as a cultural flip, which more than any technological breakthrough or mineral discovery, propelled human society into the market era. The essence of that flip was the sanctioning of self-interest. In 1714, Bernard de Mandeville emphasized the market's seemingly magical power to transmute the individual vice of greed into the virtue of good. Not only did the market have the power to neutralise greed, but it required greed as the multiplier of effective demand and hence the driver of the economy. He was roundly condemned by his contemporary John Wesley, who considered him a latter-day Machiavelli. But 60 years later, Adam Smith softened the presentation 
and the vice of greed became self-love or self-interest. Of course, it wasn't just Wesley's deeply Christian soul which was disturbed by this movement of thought. Warnings against greed, against excessive pursuit of self-interest, go back centuries into our oldest written traditions and likely long before that into our evolutionary roots because of the unbalancing effect which greed has on our social relationships and on our resource base. At the heart of this shift was a major cultural reappraisal of the character of greed or vice or self-interest or self-love. Over a relatively short period, human culture flipped from a narrative that greed is bad to an exciting new hypothesis that greed might be okay. And over time, that conviction has grown. By 1987, Gordon Gecko in the film Wall Street says, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, it cuts through, it captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, for knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. Sick. Today, there's very little stigma associated with greed. We have been conditioned to want more than we need. When recessions loom, we are often exhorted to consume more for the good of the economy, to get back to the high street, to eat out, to help out, for example. The wealth accumulations of the very rich are excused by the entrenched market narrative that presumes that the wealth that they have earned must be their fair share of doubtless much greater value that they have created for the economy. We've lost sight of the earlier understanding that warnings against greed constituted a really important balancing loop in the complex system of human society. Inequality grows, the fabric of society strains, and of course, the effect on the environment becomes more and more visible and more and more dangerous to human existence. Now we must, of course, talk about justice. The issue of justice lies at the heart of the discussions about the climate and the wider environmental crisis. If we don't recognise this, then we won't be able to find the solutions. There was a great deal of emphasis in the COP26 on the methodologies of measurement, on the technological fixes, on the enabling mechanisms for countries to transition away from fossil fuels. But what was not present to any great degree, even though there were many voices shouting it, both from inside and outside the famous blue zone, was the recognition that this problem has its roots deeply sunk in colonialism, in exploitation, in inequality, in injustice. And so technical solutions are not enough. The cost of climate change, as we're all becoming more aware, are not evenly spread. According to the IPCC, Climate change will not only affect the different regions of the world differently, but also the different generations and genders. The poorest populations will be more affected. 70% of this population, according to the UN, are women, and a large number are young women. The poorest countries in the world, the ones which did almost nothing to create the crisis, which haven't developed their economies, using vast quantities of fossil fuels, and which are now trying to develop their economies and raise the standards of living for their populations, they do not have the economic resources either to pay for mitigation or adaptation measures, or to compensate for the loss and damage wrought by our decades of inaction. Justice is a crucial foundation for the debate and for the actions which follow it. This became abundantly clear at the COP when, in the end, the concerns of the low-lying states were set aside in pursuit of what the rich and developed countries found acceptable. The principle of justice must be at the heart of the conversation and of our conversion, and how to put it there is one of the defining questions of our era. Only if we build bridges of human solidarity 
will we survive as a species? That's what we've learnt from COVID. It's been well said that we are in the same storm, but not in the same boat. That's been the slogan of Christian Aid's work on climate change. We in the parts of the world which are both prosperous and temperate are already feeling uh, its effects to some extent. We, we look at the heavy downpours outside the window, we look at the flooded streets and the storm drains which aren't coping, we sort of murmur, ah, global warming. But many millions of women, men and children on our planet in parts of the world which are less prosperous and less able to cope are already feeling the effects of it very acutely in water shortage, drought, extreme heat, violent tropical storms, flood surges, pest infestation and so on. Where life is already precarious, life is very much at risk. So, how should we move forward? With a glass of water in our hand. Let's think about behaviour. We've known about this looming crisis for decades, and for decades we've continued to assume that it's somebody else's problem. Collectively, we've taken millions of plane flights and driven billions of miles using fossil fuels. We've eaten a tremendous amount of food cultivated through unsustainable or even dangerous processes. We've wasted unbelievable quantities of energy and water. We've thrown away billions of tonnes of non-biodegradable materials, polluting our oceans and our lands. In practical and social terms, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. We're not going to return to a life of hunter-gathering, simplicity, back to nature and very basic consumption. That ship's already sailed. We're bound up in a highly complex financial and economic web which is global in its reach, albeit there's a lot of discussion about whether global capitalism has reached its limits, given its inbuilt insistence on constant growth in a world which has finite natural resources. The economist Kate Raworth has proposed an economic model which has been widely picked up on, known as donut economics. If you haven't read her book of the same name, I highly recommend it. She address addresses these issues head on. But one of the things that she points out is that our behaviour and choices are very powerfully influenced by other people's behaviour and choices. This partly explains the rise in conspicuous consumption since World War II, as advertising gained in power and reached further, wider and deeper into our society. We all know about keeping up with the Joneses. Economists have traditionally sought to change people's behaviour by changing the relative price of things. But this has often failed to achieve what they've hoped because the price signals are drowned out by much stronger signals which are coming from social networks. So there is a power in behaving well, which is very good news. It means that if we make choices which are good and not bad for the environment, and if we do it visibly, and if we talk to others about it, mm. and if enough of us do it, then there's a real possibility of wider behaviour change. We saw that in the way in which driving while under the influence of alcohol has become more and more socially unacceptable. We started to see it in the many aspects of environmental awareness and care. We turn the lights out more often, we sort our rubbish, we grow bee-friendly plants in our gardens or we leave parts of them a bit wild and so on. And we live in a society and in a world which is super networked the variety of ways in which it's networked increases all the time. The Glasgow Climate Pact was eventually dragged over the line by a group of exhausted and hungry diplomats and negotiators 10 days ago. A lot of it speaks in the language of intention, promise and aspiration. The people of our world whose lives are already daily affected by climate change and biodiversity collapse are understandably angry and frustrated. Nothing is going to change overnight. But let's recognise that we're engaged in a work of transformation of the way that we live. The human race has been able to respond to the crisis, which parts of it have created, and adapt to the realities it presents us with. And our actions are, of course, the true indication of our commitment, moving beyond the blah, 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 
the virtuous words into real change in the way we live. Learning to know how much is enough. Being revolted rather than excited by Black Friday. Systematically offsetting our carbon when we have to emit it. So what's the role of our religious and faith communities? We are citizens, we are consumers making choices, we are parents and grandparents of the generations which will inherit these challenges. And many of us are people of faith. In fact, 84% of the world's population belong to a faith group. Religion has the power to appeal not just to our minds, but to our souls. And this is where change is most needed. Some religions may be deeply implicated in this crisis, but all must be deeply implicated in the way out of it. At the beginning of October, leaders from all the major world faiths met at the Vatican and presented a document to Alok Sharma about their hopes and their commitments on the climate. As well as the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury, there were leaders of Sunni and Shia Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Zoroastrianism and Jainism, and possibly others that I haven't counted. But it was an extraordinary, united voice. One of the things that impressed me most about the two weeks I spent in Glasgow on the fringes of the COP and in the melee of the civil society response to it was the complete unity of purpose and solidarity among the faith representatives. Over and over again, I heard leaders of faith groups speaking of how care for creation was a key principle and value of their religious texts and teaching, of the practical actions which their communities are undertaking to protect nature and combat the crisis. I heard about eco-synagogue, eco-dharma, eco-Sikh, and the environment movements within Islam and the Quakers and many, many others. It was inspiring and encouraging. But in spite of these commitments and this community of purpose, I think that we have, mostly so far, failed to integrate scientific and ecological findings into our teaching and preaching and living, and to link these to our understanding of faith. And I think this has to change. We need a major infusion of energy to help faith groups to inspire behavioural change for sustainable living. The mess that we're in is a direct result of our human failings. We are beings who all too easily slip into greed, self-centeredness, lack of love and compassion, apathy, unwillingness to put anything else but ourselves at the centre of the universe and of our existence. And often we only pay attention to the well-being of others when it doesn't actually take anything away from our own prosperity and enjoyment, when it doesn't actually cost us anything. The challenges we face are outside of us, but they start inside us. We have a sickness in our souls which needs to be faced, and the sooner we face up to it, the better. Back in 2011, the Vatican's Pontifical Academy of Sciences produced a work called Fate of Mountain Glaciers in the Anthropocene. This document, 10 years ago, called on nations to recognise the impact of the Anthropocene age, to act immediately to address and reduce the risks of climate change. And in particular, it stressed that action is necessary as a matter of social justice, especially for the poor. It tied action to the biblical idea of stewardship for the earth and it linked its conclusions to the line of the Lord's Prayer about daily bread, that all the inhabitants of the planet receive their daily bread, fresh air to breathe, clean water to drink. In other words, the equally shared benefits of the commons. In 2015, Pope Francis gave us Laudato Si. Let me quote from it. He said, the external deserts in the world are growing because the internal deserts have become so vast. For this reason, the ecological crisis is also a summons to profound interior conversion. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is not an optional or a secondary aspect of our Christian experience. So here are some of the elements of an ecological conversion. First, a gratitude for what we have for whatever opportunities life affords us, and a recognition that the world is God's gift to us. Second, a sense of connection 
an awareness that we are not disconnected from all the other creatures which inhabit this planet, but are deeply joined to them. And each one of them reflects something of God and has something to teach us. Pope Francis goes on to talk about an alternative understanding of how we live our lives, developing ways of living through which we can find the deep enjoyment of being free from an obsession with consumption. This isn't what our Prime Minister calls a hair shirt. It's a radical and positive move towards a freedom which most of us don't have, a realisation that less really is more, the capacity to be happy with little, to adopt a simplicity which allows us to be more fully present and alive to each thing and each moment, detached from what we possess, not sad for what we lack. The virtues of sobriety and humility which the Pope points us to as being the way towards freedom and contentment and living life to the full are, it has to be said, not particularly favourably viewed in our age. And yet their opposites, excess, greed, mastery, will inevitably lead to harm, us to harm both our society and our environment. Pope Francis again, in a piece is closely related to care for ecology and care for the common good. Because lived out authentically, it's reflected in a balanced lifestyle, together with a capacity for wonder, which takes us to a deeper understanding of life. Nature, he says, is filled with words of love, but how can we listen to them amid constant noise, interminable and nerve-wracking distractions, or the cult of appearances? He goes on to say that individual self-improvement won't be enough. We need to act together. The ecological conversion needed to bring about lasting change is also a community conversion. So we need to regain the conviction that we need one another, Ubuntu, and that we have a shared responsibility, the commons. In short, we need to love God and each other and the whole created world. Love, Pope Francis says, is also civic and political and is the force which leads us towards building a better world. In this, we'll find the locus of climate justice, of limiting global warming, of preserving the natural world, of ending our careless overconsumption and wasteful living. The end. I'd like to thank uh, Bishop Olivia very much for, I, I, I thought, a speech which managed to give us such a range of material and spiritual issues and show the interconnectedness of them so skillfully. I'm very, very grateful. We now have just three or four minutes, which I hope we can take a few questions. Do I need to switch this on or am I? It's all right. Right. Well, let's see if we can both have any questions from our live audience and if there's a moment. Right. Uh, please. Yes. Thank you so much for such a, a rich and engaging lecture. Really appreciated it. I wanted to ask about you. You spoke about your time in Kenya and the people who had this deep connection to the land, um, and yet much of. So I'm from Canada, as you can hear from my accent. Uh, much of the people in Canada are all immigrant families. You know, I can think in my own family within about five generations, I can count 12 different countries. So where, where can a sense of that connection with the land come to for an increasingly mobile global population who have no claim to any particular land? That's, that's a good question. I think the, the voices which were powerful in, at the COP conference were the voices of the indigenous people, the indigenous people of Canada, were strong there, the indigenous people of Australia and the indigenous people of the Pacific Islands, the people who still are fully connected with their land. But I think it's a really interesting challenge. How do we find that sense of connection with the land, with the earth, with the, you know, the, with the created world, um, when, we, when we are peripatetic? Um, and uh, we know that uh, more and more um, movement of people across the world is, uh, is happening already as a result of, of 
conflict, political change, but more and more it's going to happen as a result of climate change. Uh, if nothing is done, then by the end of the century there'll be a billion people moving across the planet to try and find a bit of the planet that they can live on. Uh, and they will have lost, as you know, the refugee and migrant populations today have lost uh, the connection with the land. And yet you hear the stories, even you know, second and third generation immigrants, you'll hear the stories of, of the land. You know, talking to, uh, to West Indian communities sometimes, I've, you know, I pick that up, you know, that the stories of the land back in, say, Barbados or you know, where they come from, uh, the grandmother's stories, the, the, sense of, the sense of connection for many is still there. But I think in an increasingly mobile uh, world, that is going to be um, something that we need to work on, is how we, how we reconnect. Thank you very much for that. Um, one area that you emphasized throughout is the growth aspirations as being so, so damaging. There's another growth factor that is equally damaging, and, and that's population growth. And I wonder how you see the role of faiths in relation to population growth. Thank you. That's a, that's a big question. Um, population, population growth is actually levelling off or even declining in many countries, particularly in the developed world. Um, I think in this country we're below replacement rate now. Um, and I think that's true for many countries in Europe. The places where the population is still growing rapidly uh, is in the less developed countries. And one of the key factors in limiting population growth is actually educating women. Um, and so that's, that's uh, something which, uh, which the faith communities may well have something to, to, say, to say about. Um, in countries where uh, the education of women is being systematically suppressed, uh, it's a real problem. Uh, and that's going to last for generations, and the effect of that will last for generations. But I think, you know, this is, this is uh, not something we can, we can turn off overnight. But we know, we know we've got a lot of research, good research now, which tells us uh, of the factors that lead to population growth. You know, infant mortality rate is high. People will tend to have more children. Uh, you know, if we, women aren't educated they, uh, or don't have access to the choices uh, that might enable them to limit their fertility, that's also another factor. So it's, it's complicated and interconnected and does have impacts on the environment. Yeah. Thank you um, for your talk. Um, you use the language of uh, resource a lot um, in relation to the natural world, um, even exploitation in a positive fashion, and the language of gift as uh, the creation as a gift to humans. But it seemed to be without the corresponding task that actually we have a responsibility to care for it. And um, I suppose what I want to ask is, do you not think the language of resource, particularly when it comes to the consumption of livestock, which is a huge contributor to climate change, is that not part of the problem as to how we've got into this mess in the first place? Well, if I had my way, we'd all be vegetarians, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, li livestock is... I mean, I did mention the, the stats on how many livestock now inhabit the planet, you know, and how, how the wild mammal population has simply, you know, plummeted. And, and that is a huge issue. And you've only got to see the documentaries about the massive feedlots, you know, in North America, about the, you know, deforestation of the Amazon to grow, uh, to grow fodder crops, um, soya and so on. Um, and it's, a re it's a really serious issue. Um, I've lost track of your question. Responsibility, absolutely, we've got responsibility, you know, and if we were talking about the types of, of adjustments to our, to our behaviour that we might make if we were to adopt a more responsible attitude, then we might consider whether our meat consumption could come down a bit. Um, but I'm not preaching about vegetarianism tonight. <laughs> I'm very aware of the time, and I think this is probably the moment we should bring this to an end. Once again, thanking Bishop Olivia very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Um, I would just like to point out that uh, Rebecca there has a, a, a big collection of the lectures from last year, which you are all very welcome to have a copy of. If you'd like to get one from on the way out, you're very welcome. Thank you very much indeed.